Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Nobody. Hillary Clinton wants to abolish it, believe me. She wants to abolish our Second Amendment. I think they didn't deny it. I don't think anybody denied it. Other presidents did not call. They'd write letters, and some presidents didn't do anything. Many people have come out and said, I'm right. You really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Hello and welcome to Fallacious Trump, the podcast where we use the insane ramblings of old Yeller to explain logical fallacies. I'm your host, Jim. And I'm your other host, Mark. A logical fallacy is an error in reasoning that results in bad or invalid arguments. And the logical fallacy we're looking at this week is sour grapes. So sour grapes is one which, for the first time, I'm not fully convinced is necessarily a logical fallacy. Oh, okay. It is a way of rationalising stuff. It's basically a thing that people use called post hoc rationalisation where they kind of make something they did or felt after the fact feel like it made sense. Right, (laughs) right. So in a way, the reason I'm not sure it fits into our list of logical fallacies but certainly it is will it does appear on other lists and other people claim it is a fallacy right is because it isn't used quite so often to argue something or to provide evidence of an argument you're making so much as it is to convince yourself of something ah okay it doesn't it also convince others that you're right it can be or at least to convince them that you don't care if you're wrong. Or to dismiss something that's levelled against you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see in some of the examples, yeah. yeah. Basically, where post hoc rationalisation comes in is to get rid of cognitive dissonance, which happens when right. you have two opposing feelings or thoughts that you're trying to deal with. Yeah. And that makes your brain uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and so you want to yeah. resolve that. And one of the ways to resolve it is to rationalise a decision you made and explain it away. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of psychological studies on it. One study by Ragunathan and Huang, they looked into post hoc rationalisations and how they make people feel better. And and one of the Mm -hmm. things that is quite a common one is that people will buy stuff based on emotion. They'll buy things because they think, oh, I I want that. Okay but they'll justify it claiming that they needed it or have some reason for having bought it. Yeah, That yes, wasn't the reason yeah. they bought it, but it makes them feel better about it. Yes, because then, then because in the moment of buying it, you're already getting buyer's remorse. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like that bit when you're going shopping and you've only got a certain amount of cash in your pocket, but then if the thing that you want is above that, then it, begins, then it gets into the realm of not money because yeah, yeah. you just pay for it on a card. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, and you kind of justify that away and you go, well, I've still got all this cash. Yeah. I've not spent the cash. So yeah. one thing that Ragunathan and Huang did when they were looking into this was they presented mm-hmm. people with two pictures, two photos of chickens and asked them to choose which one <laughs> right. they would want to eat. Right. And one of the yeah. chickens was a nice kind of plump, healthy-looking chicken. And the other one yeah. was quite kind of thin and maybe a bit sick looking but right. but for half of the groups they'd said that the the plump one was more healthy but less tasty it wouldn't taste as good and the oh, okay. the, the yeah. thinner one was kind of genetically engineered to taste great but wasn't as healthy as the other chicken both right. groups pretty much overwhelmingly chose the plump healthy looking chicken the nice looking chicken yeah but they yeah. justified it differently based on what they were told. So if they were told that right. was the, the healthier one that didn't taste as good, they claimed that their decision was based on the fact that they valued the health of the chicken over the taste of the chicken, that that, that was more important <laughs> right. to them. But the right. other group who were told that the genetically engineered one was actually healthier but didn't taste as good, they chose the plump one because they said, well, taste is the most important thing. Right. So that's why I'm choosing this one. So they both made the same choice, yeah. having been given different information and justified it to themselves in different ways, when actually they just chose it because it looked nicer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, the that's the reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't want – I'm picturing it in my head as a kind of, you know, a foghorn leg or a <laughs> scrawny, scrawny chicken versus healthy one. You'd want to eat the healthy one. Yeah. Because it just – yeah, it looks nicer because you get that whole – um, Tom and Jerry thing where it fades through to roasted chicken. This is why 
I think it we can justify, <laughs> even it's a, if it's a post hoc rationalisation, this appearing in our podcast is because it is faulty reasoning. This is an example of yeah. people yeah. using faulty reasoning because the yeah. the reasons that you come up with by using this method are not logical. Right, yes. They yeah. are not commonly used or very frequently used at least to back up arguments to other people then they're, they're more frequently used to justify your own bad decision making or perhaps just right. even hasty or, or emotional decision making which isn't necessarily wrong but it isn't probably based on the logic you're later claiming it is mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the sour grapes name comes from the Aesop's fable of the fox and the grapes where the mm. fox is trying to get some nice plump juicy grapes from a yeah. grape vine um, but it's out of reach he can't get them tries and tries, gives up, and rather than going, oh, well, I can't get the nice, plump, juicy grapes, he decides... I'll ask for some help from the elephant. Yeah, he decides that, oh, they they were probably sour anyway. They were probably not even... It's not even worth it. I'm glad I didn't get them in the end. It's better that I didn't get them because they were probably horrible. Yeah. So our first example from Trump actually comes from Salma Hayek, who right. said in an interview with... A, and the reason I don't have a clip is because the interview was in Spanish. So I, I could have played it. Some of our listeners might have understood it, but it would have been like a minute yeah. and a half of, of a lot of our listeners not knowing what the hell's going on. Could have Google translated that and then faded it in. I did a, an yeah. AI translation, but it didn't sound anything like Salma Hayek. It sounded weird because <laughs> she has a very specific <laughs> voice. But, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, she said to a a Spanish radio show, El Show de Mandril, about Trump asking her out. He befriended her boyfriend at the time to try and get her phone number. And then he asked her out. And she told him that she wouldn't even go out with him if if she wasn't with someone else. If she didn't have a boyfriend, she still wouldn't (laughs) go out with him. Yeah. And then, this is a horrible, course, small-handed, yeah. fake-haired, orange-tanned idiot, yeah. etc. You know, put in your insults now. And then yeah. she says, someone told the National Enquirer, I'm not going to say who, because you know that whatever he wants to come out comes out in the National Enquirer. It said that he wouldn't go <laughs> yeah. out with me because I was too short. Right. So her claim, at least, is that Trump told the National Enquirer that he didn't want to go out with Sam Hayek because yeah. she's too short for him. It's essentially right. that that I can't have her. I didn't want her anyway. She's she's short. That you know, notoriously, short. disgustingly yeah. short Selma Hayek. That yeah. <laughs> nobody would want to go out with. Why would anyone? No, because uh, yeah, because that height. It's the same she's with hideous, Kylie Minogue. Same thing. She's like yeah, you know, five foot two and a half, whatever. You know, uh-huh. blimey. So yep. our second example nice. from Trump comes from a tweet from 2014. He had previously tried to buy the Buffalo Bills, the NFL team, but didn't yep. get his bid accepted. It went to someone else. And he tweeted in October of 2014, the NFL games are so boring now that actually I'm glad I didn't get the Bills. Boring games, too many flags, too soft. Brilliant. And has continued to berate the NFL pretty much ever since, really, yeah. because he didn't win the bid. He didn't get a team. Yeah. But he's glad. He's glad he didn't because it's rubbish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because the same way that Samuel Hyatt wouldn't even entertain the notion yeah. that the NFL are going, yeah, we really don't want Trump <laughs> involved in that. We're not going to, no, 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 let's sell it to somebody else. And so Trump's going, oh, yeah, just as well, didn't, yeah, didn't want it. Like, didn't want it anyway. Mm. Don't want it. No, <laughs> didn't want it anyway. <laughs> Bloody awful. And that's the thing about the sour grapes thing is, well, why were you in it in the first place if the thing is so shit Yeah. now? And it's so transparent. <laughs> it is the logical equivalent of essentially being sent to your room and going, oh, I wanted to go to my room anyway. I was going to go there now. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 It's where I keep my toys. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Didn't want to watch that. Didn't want to play that. Just stupid. And you go, okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that I did you that service of not allowing you to go out with someone. You're like welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Which is brilliant because that's per- the perfectly <laughs> annoying parental thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right, then. well, glad I did you the favour. Thanks. Kudos to me. Yeah, yeah. And so you can right, you can twist the knife. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So our uh, <laughs> third example is from Trump World, yeah. in as much as kind of MAGA verse and uh, right wing media, right. because Taylor Swift has recently started going out with. NFL tight end Travis Kelsey. And she 
has previously spoken out against Trump and specifically against Marsha Blackburn. And also in a single Instagram story that she did that said, basically, use your powerful voice, get out and vote. Yeah. Recruited 30,000 new voters of wow. of kind of her demographic, young, yeah. Yeah. probably Democrats, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to register yeah. to vote. Yeah, Didn't maybe, tell yeah. them to vote Democrat. No. Just said, Just you know, it's important that you use your voice, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And everyone went, okay, Taylor Swift, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, as the Republicans hate people voting, that's dangerous. Yeah, full stop, yeah. Travis Kelsey, meanwhile, has spoken out in favour of vaccines. In fact, he did an ad for Pfizer to promote getting your, your flu and your COVID shot together. Right. Um, he's done an ad for Bud Light. He's been outspoken just generally kind of politically in favour of, of democracy. He, I think... <laughs> Um, took a knee yeah. uh, during the national anthem once. Yeah. So these two rich, famous, beautiful, powerful people getting yeah. together yeah. is d- a disaster for Republicans. And right. they have become determined to claim that these two people are bad, evil, and also shit and ugly. <laughs> 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 so yeah. so yeah. Uh, right-wing YouTuber Clay Travis said this. You are wasting your time with Travis Kelsey. He is a dime a dozen. He's not that good looking. His career is almost over. You can do better. Even if you want to date a tight end in the NFL. I don't know how many of them are single. A lot of them are better looking than Travis Kelsey. And they're younger. They're going to be in the league for longer. In three years, Travis Kelsey is going to be done in the NFL. What's he going to be doing? WWE wrestling? Taylor Swift want to date a WWE wrestler? Now, Travis Kelsey yeah. is older than most tight ends. In right. fact, he's 34. He's just turned 34 this week, which is pretty old for a tight end. Yeah. So he's still got all his hair and his own teeth. Crikey. Yeah, he is. Ancient. He's not only that, but he is like one of the best, not just one of the best tight ends of all time, but one of the best currently playing. Even yeah. at 34, compared to the other, the like 24-year-olds he's mostly yeah. playing against. Yeah. This season... He's had 36 receptions and 346 yards. We're like six weeks into the season, uh, wow. which is ridiculous. Wow. I mean, that's more. That's that's the most. That's the most yardage and uh, and receptions of any tight end in the league. Um, he's got three receiving touchdowns, again, equal to the most in the league at the moment uh, during this season. He's had seven consecutive seasons with 1,000-plus yards receiving. He's had the wow. most yards in a single season of any tight end in history. Yeah. During a season when he only played 15 games, wow. he's the fifth tight end in history to have more than 10,000 yards in his career. Basically, he is one of the top tight ends that there is. Right now, despite the fact he's 10 years older than most of the people who were competing at that level. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So to suggest that he's at the end of his career, he's rubbish, he's not even that good or that good looking is insane. And it is clearly just bitter sour grapes. Yeah, and of course Taylor Swift is going to be listening to a um, (laughs) a bitter incel YouTuber. Yeah. As to some advice about her relationships. Well, yeah, I mean, apart from anything else, even if it was true that he was at the end of his career and wasn't going to be making any more money out of the NFL, so fucking what? She's Taylor Swift. He, yeah. Travis Kelsey, not only one of the highest paid football players in the NFL, yeah. he, he's on a $57 million four-year contract at the moment. Her era's tour has brought in about his annual salary every single night that the tour has been running. What? So I don't think she's worried about yeah. whether he's rich yeah. or not. No. I think she's fine. But that's a very kind of not a Democrat equality kind of viewpoint. So, well, you know, you're tying your star to this this yeah. fading... So this has been who's only bah. worth $30 million. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, yeah, you're not... <laughs> How are you going? Well, that's, yeah, there you go. You get an insight into how much money you, the Republicans think mm-hmm. you need to be able to survive in to to keep you away from the poor and, you know, and the, and the workers. And, all, yeah, well, you see, you're not going to be, she's not going to have any problems. She just need to put out another <laughs> hour and do some more touring. But, yeah. yeah. But that guy, Clay Travis, was kind of, he wasn't, 
rude or disrespectful to Taylor Swift as such. I mean, he was he was a bit, but kind of Republican levels of rude and disrespectful. Right. Not not, not actively attacking her. Yeah. He was saying like, "You're too good for this." loser who's one of the best in the business yeah. so he was kind of saying like taylor swift you shouldn't be with this guy whereas yeah. other people have gone in the other direction uh, sean davis wrote an article for the federalist the title of it was taylor swift is dumb and her music sucks Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then a right-wing guy called roger kimball uh replied to that tweet saying also she is homely <laughs> so for some reason, they have this need wow. to yeah. portray the people who are against them yeah. as not just politically opposed to them and wrong, but bad at what they do and ugly. And, uh, <laughs> and ugly. Despite yeah. ridiculous amounts of evidence to the country. And now is the time, I think, for Mark's British politics. Corner. I thought immediately when talking about sour grapes, it's about when people lose elections. So I was thinking, right, is there is there examples of where Sunak lost out to Liz Truss, where Corbyn lost to Boris Johnson, where Farage has lost to anything? And yeah, sure enough, we'll come to that. But but it's it's kind of difficult to find that because it doing such similar things to yeah, she's dumb and the music sucks, and also she's ugly in a political milieu means well certainly britain that you're going to come in for some stick and it, and basically your career is over so i did look at those kind of pivot points where the losers of an election will often say oh yeah well it wasn't worth winning and you, and you think well why were you campaigning so vehemently for this thing so i found several examples and the most brilliant one featuring a politician we've never heard of, and we'll find out why, in the August 2019 elections for the post of Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria, told you it was obscure, <laughs> the Lib Dems put up a candidate, Jonathan Wallace, who at the time was the Lib Dems parliamentary candidate for the Bladen constituency. But in the election for the Police and Crimes Commissioner for Northumbria, he was eliminated in the first round. So the first round, he scored 28,000. Conservatives got 33,267. Then the Independent got 33,704. And the out-and-out uh, -out winner, Kim McGuinness from the Labour Party, got 58,355. The highest scorers of the first round go through the second round. So he got eliminated. Jonathan Wallace got eliminated. And on a rant whilst driving YouTube message, he said this. I, th I think sadly for the system, uh, the governance system, and I think that this form of governance that we've got is rubbish, uh, but the other three candidates were lightweights, at best. Now the Labour candidate was a little more than uh, Barbie doll reading from his script. There you go. So he didn't wow. he didn't go forward. So <laughs> so he dismisses the entire system that allows this kind of you know, the first two people who get the highest score go through the second round, because you can only have one representative, you can't have all four. So What's the best way of doing it? Well, let's put the let's see who scores the highest, and if it's one that scores higher than everybody else by a big margin, we'll have, we'll, have, we'll just select them. If there are two, we'll just eliminate the two lowest. Surely, it seems like a good system, but no, the governance system is rubbish. So not so I don't know why I even bother standing because the system itself absolute crap. Also, the candidates were lightweight <laughs> at best, and. Didn't count himself in that, but they can't. They weren't that lightweight that they didn't beat him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All three of them, even the one that got eliminated with him, beat him by five thousand votes. And then he describes the winner as a Barbie reading a script. Kim McGuinness got re-elected in the post in twenty twenty one. Jonathan Wallace didn't stand mm. for that post in twenty twenty one. Also, he came third in the Bladen constituency in 2017 general election and weirdly didn't present the Lib Dems in the December 2019 election. 
possibly something to do with those kind of misogynist kind of, you know, what the fuck? All of that. Yeah. So now he's a local councillor. That's it. That's his career over. Speaking of elections, we're going back in time as further back uh, to 2015. And pretty much every newspaper predicted that in the Oldham West and Royton by-election in December 2015, Labour would struggle to hold the seat. Might hold it by a few hundred votes. And this was the first election after Jeremy Corbyn became the Labour leader. So they're still in opposition, but he's he's taken over the leadership. Everybody's a bit doubtful about it. This is the first by-election. And Nigel Farage's UKIP candidate loses to Corbyn's Labour Party in this by-election. Um, and the Labour candidate won uh, with 17,000 votes. UKIP got 6,000 and the Conservatives got 2,000. The morning after the election, Farage says this. Massive increase in the number of postal votes yesterday. So somebody was out there harvesting the postal votes. But there's a bigger question. Why do we have postal voting on this scale at all? You know, we used to have it for people who were elderly, infirm, or who worked overseas. Now we have whole blocks of communities signed up to postal votes. And in many ways, you could say these by-election results are over before the contest has even begun. Sour grapes? No. Bad loser? No, no, no. Look, I've said this at every single by-election for the last three or four years. Yeah, but you've said and, it every time you've lost. You've used this as an well, excuse in South well, Thanet, and they said that, you know, they found no, no evidence didn't. at I didn't, all. I didn't mention it in South Thanet at all. I'm talking particularly about by-elections. And don't forget, we've had... Tower Hamlets, evidence of fraud within the postal voting system. So I'm raising that. I think British democracy sh you know, should be clean, um, and I think with this system it's not. I don't remember him moaning about postal votes when they won a the by-election. I think the truth is Labour won a stonking great victory in Oldham. Why on earth should anybody suggest, until they've provided some evidence or, or indeed said that they're going to report this to the police, anybody draw any connection between Jim's brilliant win in Oldham and what happened in Tower Hamlets. I think it's complete sour grapes from Nigel Farage. He just needs to learn to lose a little better. So that second voice was Owen Smith, who was the candidate for leadership against Corbyn in 2015. So part of Farage's argument is that he's, he calls the whole system bent because they didn't win. He says it's a bent, bent postal system. But it's the same deal with... King Trump. <laughs> oh, yeah, postal voting, all that not in non in person voting, it's all open to corruption and fraud. The thing is that the postal vote was about 7,000 people. Labour's majority was 11,000 in the election. And part of Farage's argument is that he's seen some 30 something by elections. And this is a bad one. And also guilt by association that the election fraud in Tower Hamlets, which was upheld in 2014 and was a Labour candidate. And but Owen <laughs> Smith says, well, he's got nothing, nothing to do with that. And why is he trying to tie the two together? And he doesn't complain when he wins. So two hours after this morning interview, Farage's UKIP, the UK Independence Party backtracked slightly and said it would consider the evidence before lodging an official complaint. And it didn't lodge one. I hope and pray that my sense of this tonight is wrong. And my sense of this, and no, I'm not conceding, but my sense of this is that the government's registration scheme, getting two million voters on, the 48-hour extension may be what tips the balance. So that was him talking a year later on the eve of the referendum vote to leave the EU. And I, I would submit that he's having a pre-sour <laughs> grapes moment. So this is the, the evening before the result comes out, and it's looking like Remain will win, and, and so we'll all stay in the EU and Leave won't win. So instead of saying, oh, I'm not conceding, but... It looks like we're going to lose. He's saying, I'm not conceding, but it looks like the system is completely biased against <laughs> us. So yeah. that's, he's, he's, he's setting up the possibility of the sour grapes. He's saying, this system we're all involved in is just ultimately corrupt because there were 2 million registered voters extra. He's assuming they all voted Remain. They didn't. 
and and that they extended the the forty eight hours voting bit to, for registration would mean that more remainers would be able to. It's the usual Republican Democrat thing. If we give people the chance to vote, they will all vote Democrat. Also, he added that if there was a fifty two percent to forty eight percent in favour of Remain, he would never shut <laughs> up about it. Yeah. And and then because the Remainers who lost by the same percentage, the same ratio, didn't don't shut up shut up about it. He says you should shut up about this. He turned up at the bloody Tory party conference this year with his same smug frog like face, thinking I've <laughs> oh, changed the only face politics he's got. for the better. It's the only face he's got. <laughs> to be fair. The, uh, yeah, yeah. That's because nobody in their right mind would kiss him and turn him into a prince. <laughs> Yeah, and then, you know, he's still saying, oh, I've changed the face of politics. Yeah, you've turned it into a fucking frog face. His acceptance is he's always going to be the bridesmaid, never the bride. So, and he always blames the system. But I think part of his modus operandi, his, his, the thing that keeps him going, that gets him out of bed in the morning, is that somebody somewhere is corrupting the system. He is the corrupt part of the system. And yet he accuses everybody else of corrupting that. He's kind of, no wonder he turned up with Trump and visited his golden toilet in Trump Town. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to just squeeze in a cheeky example for, and bring it up to date, last week, Richard Walker, who's the executive chairman of Iceland in the frozen goods store and major Tory party donor, gave 9,000 this year. And his father, Malcolm Walker, gave 165,000, left the Tory party having at one time announced that he would stand for them at the next election, saying this. It's become clear to me over recent months that um, the Conservative Party are drifting out of touch with the needs of business, um, of the environment, and also the everyday people that my business touches and serves. Now, that's Richard Walker. I know some of your colleagues will say he's grumpy because he wanted to be a Conservative MP and hasn't found a seat to run in. So that voice is uh, Laura Kunzberg there. So this is her programme last Sunday. She's in there spotting that, and they have done it, that Tory insiders are using what is the sour grapes argument against Richard Walker in order to dismiss his points, which are that the Tory party is out of touch, they're going against the environmental standards, they don't give a shit about their workers, and all of the things that he actually is lauded for doing, and everybody's thinking, and yet you want to stand for the Tory party? So finally he's kind of seen the light, and he's making levelling these accusations at Rishi Sunak, who scoffs in a, a very rehearsed way. Uh, at the very thought that these are things that they need to address and that they are doing wrong. He's just a bit grumpy because we haven't yet found him a seat to stand in. So therefore, the sour grapes argument can be used by one's opponents to dismiss all of the valid points that you're making against you, I would submit. Thirteen years we've been with them Could you tell me whose time we're wasting? The sick of blue, it's been too rough In 2024, can't come soon enough We're Rishi baiting In two blings, we're on to the next bling And all it took to say goodbye He scrambles for the hook, but he's off the line Rishi's been waiting for the chance Maybe he's never lived We told him we wouldn't leave Then we did We're laughing when he's not around He begs for our attention when he's been down He only reaches for us when the palaces are in the wild His head looks like a grave that's been stepped on by a tiny child He only reaches for us when the palaces are in the wild He only reaches for us when the palaces are in the wild That's James Marriott there with the track called Grapes so in The Fallacy in the Wild, we like to talk about the fallacy of the week from a non-political perspective. And this week, our clips have a purely coincidental kind of musical theme. Right. Because our first one is from I Love Lucy. And this is an episode where she and Ethel and some friends have formed a band 
formed an orchestra, right. but she has been chucked out because she's bad at playing her saxophone. And as it turns out, the rest of the band is also very, very bad. <laughs> rag never sounded like that before. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Oh, hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Well, if it isn't Ethel Mertz and her makes you want to stick your fingers in your ears music. <laughs> oh, come on now. No use being sore just because we won't let you play with the orchestra. So... Yeah, yeah, she is basically <laughs> saying, well, this is a rubbish band. Yeah. And kind of justifying the fact that she didn't, you know, she's glad she's not in it. It's rubbish. It's terrible. But, I mean, she's got a point. But they're also saying, you're just saying that you don't like it yes. because you can't be in it. Yes. So they, there's, there's two two versions of the of the Sour Grapes application. Yeah. And she goes on to, to rope Ricky into trying to make them better, uh, which he can't because they're terrible. Our second example is from Father Ted. And this is also when Father Ted and Father Dougal have kind of formed a band because this is the Song for mm-hmm. Europe episode with My Lovely Horse mm. in which they are competing to become Ireland's entry yeah. in what is essentially the Eurovision Song Contest. Yeah. And uh, they are also very bad. And one of the other contestants <laughs> complains that he should have won. What's going on? I mean, our song was clearly miles better than theirs. Well, we thought... I mean, for God's sake, it was the same note over and over again. Yes, but we, we admired it, so... Yeah, well, it, it, you know, there was the order of a bucket and thrown flying. Your your day hadn't happened, there was a spirit the whole way. Exactly. Oh, oh. Fred put it better than I ever could. Yeah, so there. <laughs> Anyone would think you wanted Ireland to lose the next Eurosong contest. <laughs> Why would we want to do that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe because it was costing you too much to stage. So Father Dick Byrne there, who was the one who had put Father on... Father Martin Byrne. Is he related to Father Martin Byrne? <laughs> Father Dick Byrne. Yeah. This is Father Dick Byrne. Yeah. He yeah. put on a much better performance mm. than uh, Dougal and Ted's and actually hit on the exact reason that they chose Ted and Dougal instead. Yeah. yeah. Because it was far too expensive to host the uh, the Song for Europe competition and they, so they desperately wanted to lose. But... <laughs> The reasoning that got him there <laughs> was essentially that, you know, I I should have won. I feel like I did a better job than them. I should have won. There must be yeah. something else going on behind the scenes. This is all rigged. This is, you know, there's there's other reasons yeah. why I didn't win. And there's that beautifully measured laugh where they come on and go, ah, oh, how can you be so silly? Yet? And then there's <laughs> like a, the beat where you've just, in, in, which, in which you can insert... Well, that's exactly why. And <laughs> yeah. then they try and laugh it off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And our third example is from an actual band, Flight of the Concords. Yeah. Uh, this is a band meeting with Murray. So, good news anyway. We've got a winner for the fan competition. Mel? Yeah, how'd you know that? Because there was probably only one entry. No, there was hundreds, actually. Really? Yep. They're all from Mel and one from Jermaine. Right. But he was disqualified. Disqualified? Yep. Why was I disqualified? Because you can't be a fan of the band. Why? It's not a good look. But I'm a fan. Yeah, but people look at the fan list and they say, oh, hang on, that guy's in the band, isn't he? Oh, he likes himself. It's not a good look. You don't see Brett on the fan list. Yeah, well, that's because I'm not a fan of the band. I'm more a fan of popular bands, or the Bee Gees, Pearl Jam. All right. This is what we're trying to do is become popular. That's why I've got this competition, you know? All right, what did Mel win? First prize, the chance to cook for you two tomorrow night. It's a terrible prize. I'm glad I didn't win that. <laughs> it's kind of, it reminds me that the kind of circular reasoning <laughs> reminds me of the hello echoes have you got the time yeah i got it on the pixel people it's that yeah it's that <laughs> i only like popular bands but that's why we're running in the competition yeah uh-huh. and i you didn't enter yeah jermaine entered but he's disqualified but i like the band so he entered the competition presumably hoping to win didn't win yeah. But feels yeah. now pleased that he didn't win because the prize is rubbish. Because the prize is you get to cook. For, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, so arguably, good. he's not justifying feeling happy that he didn't win. He's genuinely thinking that is a rubbish prize. That could be said. Yeah, but, yeah. But it, part of it may be that yeah. now that equally makes him feel better. 
uh, not winning the thing he entered, and or being disqualified even not ju- not just not winning, uh, yeah. but like the, the <laughs> yeah. unfairness of being disqualified for not being able to enter his own competition. It might also be tempered by the fact that Mel is completely crazy, and I wouldn't trust her cooking True. skills as a result yeah, of yeah. that. So we're going to we're going to play fake news, folks. I love the game. It's a great game. I understand the game as well as anybody, as well as anybody. Yes, it's time for fake news, the game where I read out three Trump quotes, two of which are real and one I made up. And Mark has to figure out which one is fake news. You see, week after week, I struggle with this. And for, and for what? To, to get the accolade of a corrupt and biased scoring system bestowed on me. But it. But it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Well, I'm glad you feel that because you've won five in a row now. Oh, yeah, well, that's all very yeah, well. I think I, I agree. <laughs> I think it's just it's clearly a faulty system that shouldn't be taken yeah. seriously. Exactly. Yeah. All those postal votes being stuffed in at the last minute. Yeah. 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 The whole thing is corrupt. It's corrupt beyond belief. Yeah. I wouldn't want to win it, <laughs> even if I did. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, I am. <laughs> so I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Yeah. I, there's no theme this week unusually oh, the, the, oh, okay. these these are just all kind of he's been talking a lot over the last week or so basically ever since he right. left the courtroom in new york where yeah. he was kind of just sitting sulking mostly for the, the first couple of days and then decided he had yeah. enough he's been going around just spouting off nonsense at people anyone who will listen right. stuff on truth social stuff at rallies campaign stops and he's been he's been to several places in iowa so these are just some things from from places he's talked. Yeah. The first one was from yeah. Truth Social. He said, Romney, who today couldn't get elected dog catcher in the great state of Utah, should have beaten an absolutely failed first term Obama, should have beaten him very easily. If he and Rhino Paul fought as hard against Obama as they do against President Donald J. Trump, they would never have lost. They would have beaten Obama. But remember, Republicans eat their young. They really do. They eat their young. Terrible statement, but it's true. And that's the problem with so many in our party. They just don't have the loyalty and strength to stick together. They go after people who are on their side rather than the radical left Democrats that are destroying our country. Wow. There's a lot of anger in there, isn't there? Wow. If they worked hard against Obama, but then to go into Republicans eat their young, what? They really do. They hear the, No, they don't. No, no, they don't. And also... You're a Republican. Why would you? He's uh, so, every it's, in, it's everybody's against me, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Okay, <laughs> that's the trouble with it. No, you're the trouble with the party. Yeah. Uh, wow. Statement number two. Okay. This was yep. a campaign stop in New Hampshire. He said, "Brilliant, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. He did amazing, really amazing things for this country, which nobody ever talks about." and he's being treated like a criminal. And make no mistake, it's because he wouldn't let himself be used to attack me. They wanted to attack me. Of course they did. They never stopped, and I don't think they ever will stop, because I refuse to back down. It's really a problem, because I see what needs to be done, and it's stuff that nobody else can do. So what am I supposed to do? I'm the only one that can fix it. And Rudy knows that, so he's happy. He told me he's happy that they're coming after him. He's proud. (laughs) Wow. 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 That's great, isn't it? Oh, he did amazing things which nobody ever talks about. And he's been treated like a criminal because <laughs> he is. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And statement uh, number three, yeah. this was a yeah. campaign stop in Iowa, I think. He was talking about electric boats. <laughs> he said, <laughs> "Right." I said, so let me ask you, let's say your boat goes down and I'm sitting on top of this big powerful battery and the boat's going down, do I get electrocuted? And he said, you know what, honestly, nobody's ever asked me that question. But if I'm sitting down and that boat's going down and I'm on top of a battery and the water starts flooding in, I'm getting concerned. But then I look 10 yards to my left and there's a shark over there. So I have a choice of electrocution or shark. You know what? I'm going to take electrocution. I will take electrocution every single time. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's kind of foreshadowing of the chair, isn't it? Wow. (laughs) What? Actually, I've never actually thought about that. Mainly because <laughs> don't you always have a don't you have a battery on a on a motor launch? You you press a button and it runs the starter to start the engine. So that needs a battery to do that. And you're on a boat and there's a battery to run all of, to run the sound system and the lights and the fridge. And I, you're always going to have a 
batch on a boat. So why would why would nobody ever ask you that question? Okay, yeah, it's a random. Yeah, not there's some sort of normally there's a common thread through them all, which le- leads me somehow to to think. Oh well, okay, well that one's a a, common thread is insanity. Of tangent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, mm, okay, talking about himself in the third person. If they hard against Obama as they do against President Donald J. Trump. Feels a very Trumpian thing, but the electrocution and sharks are just ah, because it would be lovely to just continue to play. I'm going to take electrocution every time (laughs) when he's sitting in the chair, and we just on over the footage. We just play that. You go, yeah, you see, you can see it coming. See, I was thinking that the second one, the the being being happy to be attacked, was was. Not real, but then you get to the bit where he says he's told me he's happy that they're coming after him. He's proud. Suddenly feels real. <sighs> okay, they wanted to attack me. Of course they did. They never stopped. I don't think they ever will stop. Because I refuse to back down. That might be a tell. Okay, so I, yeah, all right, we'll go for that. I think number two. Two is the one that you made up. Okay, and which of the other two is more convincing to you? Weirdly, number three, the boats and the electrocution. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You think yeah. he just randomly imagined a shark while he was busy imagining himself sinking in an electric yeah. boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And number three is real. Yeah. Oh. I said so. <laughs> so let me ask you, let's say your boat goes down and I'm sitting on top of this big, powerful battery... And the boat's going down. Do I get electrocuted? And he said, you know what? Honestly, nobody's ever asked me that question. But if I'm sitting down and that boat's going down and I'm on top of a battery, and the water starts flooding in, I'm getting concerned. But then I look 10 yards to my left and there's a shark over there. So I have a choice of electrocution or shark. You know what I'm going to take? Electrocution. I will take electrocution every single time. What point does he think he's making? <laughs> yeah. like he's and then I looked and you to my left and there's a dog over elect- there. Elect- yeah. Electrocution. <laughs> like, he's <What>? like <laughs> he's trying yeah, to he's, be anti-electric, and yet he's basically saying, "Yeah, actually, uh, no, it's better. It's better." Because at least I'll be electrocuted shark, before fine. the sharks Basically, get me. What a brilliant invention. <laughs> we should all go electric. That's a brilliant idea. Of course nobody's asked the boat guy no. that question. <laughs> it's a fucking stupid question. Yeah. Of course they've thought about the fact about that, that there's and electricity in and water. it's insulated box. Yeah. Yes. First of all, yeah. it's really hard to get electrocuted by a battery. It's a different kind of current. There's, and the, the current, basically, it's current that is most dangerous. It needs to be with a certain yeah. amount of voltage. But the reason yeah. that if you get attached to the mains in some way, that's a problem for you, is because of the large yeah. amount of current that is going through your body to the ground. Yeah. If, if you touch both ends of a battery, you don't feel anything. There's very little current. The voltage is quite low. Well, anyway. you know, you, um, yeah, because we've all stuck our tongue on one you of those. Set your tongue on a nine volt battery, things. you get a little buzz, yeah. but you don't get electrocuted. Get, uh, yeah, and no. and the kinds of batteries that you get on boats tend to be quite low voltage, quite low current. Um, you know, yeah. you're not going to get a big deal from them if they are. Yeah, ones that power big electric boats that require more power more voltage for some reason that generally the the size of them is for the storage rather than for the extra voltage the voltage is constant they need to be bigger because they store the energy chemically yeah but they are just like the batteries for cars because cars unbelievably electric cars sometimes go through puddles or are in the rain so they've thought about this shit Yeah, they are completely yeah. enclosed, and there are it, the water yeah. doesn't get into the battery. It get the 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 wires that come out of the battery are insulated and separated from any place where yeah. water might get in, and even more in yeah. a boat. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a bit like having electric light in the bathroom. Yeah, people think about this stuff. 
They don't just go, OK, we'll have naked terminals. Yeah. Trump thinks he's the, the first water. person yeah. to have considered this. Thought about it. He thinks that everything is like putting an electric fire into a bath. I'm surprised he didn't put a sir in there. <laughs> and he said, you know, sir, honestly, nobody's ever asked me that question. Since 1876, <laughs> because we've sorted that out. Nobody's thought to ask me that because they're not stupid like you are, you big ginger fool. So, uh, you also think number one's real? I also think number one is real, though I'm I'm beginning to have my doubts. And number one mm-hmm. is real. Romney, who today couldn't get elected dog catcher in the great state of Utah, should have beaten an absolutely failed first-term Obama. Should have beaten him very easily. If he and Rhino Paul fought as hard against Obama as they do against President Donald J. Trump, they would never have lost. They would have beaten Obama. But remember, Republicans eat their young. They really do. They eat their young. Terrible statement, but it's true. The fuck? And that's the problem with so many in our party. They just don't have the loyalty and the strength to stick together. They go after people who are on their side rather than the radical left Democrats that are destroying our country. Yeah, it's really bad when people go after people who are on the same side as them politically, isn't it? Yeah, they just don't have the loyalty. Like that loser Romney and rhino Paul Ryan. Yeah, yeah, because they just eat And no talent Bill Barr and other people who he talked about in this rant. Wow. He was exclusively calling Republicans losers and pointless because they attack Republicans. Because they go after people on their own side. Yeah. There's no loyalty. Yeah. No loyalty. (laughs) He's disgusted by it. (laughs) Wow. Wow. So we've had a few guesses. Oh, yeah. On Patreon and Facebook. Yeah. On Facebook, we've got one of each, basically. We've got uh, Mike Mm. says two is fake. Never heard him be complimentary to anyone. (laughs) <laughs> Scott says, I think number one is fake. I doubt he knows anything about dog catchers. And, <laughs> and Andrew nice. says, I'll go with three. I don't think he'd choose either, like electrocution or shark. He'd somehow ask oh, if right. the battery could electrocute the shark. Nobody ever thought to do that to save themselves that way before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. on Patreon, we got uh, <laughs> Becca said, I think number three is the fake. And Colleen said, I'm going number two is fake because he's been increasingly batshit and the other two statements are battier. And also, oh, okay. uh, Stormy Daniels said he's super afraid of sharks and I just enjoy believing stuff she says about him. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the tell for me was actually I refuse to back down ah. because of the later story that's mm. coming up. See, I didn't yeah. deliberately insert that, but it may have been in my subconscious. It, but in your background, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But it was, yeah, but, it, but you see, with the advances in AI, I think we should just <laughs> play those ones anyway. We should just make it do that. Oh, I listened to The Sultans of Swing with an AI Biden and Trump oh. singing it. It was it was excellent. So it's like, you know, the kind of Biden's cadence and his slightly, you know, limited range mumbly vocals and then Trump with his abrasive ends of sentences where the where the em- em- emphasis is completely on the wrong syllable. Right. And it, oh, it was just great. And I think people have kind of send this guy, whoever he does it, they send him requests, say, yeah, can you do? I got you, babe. <laughs> and you know, that's kind of, or you're the one that I want, or something like that. Uh-huh. Oh, that's so good. So, yes, it, it ought to be possible to get, to find an AI thing that would just create these, create the ones, yeah, and this is the one that is fake. But here he is saying it <laughs> would be great, wouldn't it? God. Yeah. Hey, so that means. That means six in a row. This is getting ridiculous. Oh, I no. know. Yeah. I should. I think we need to have words with the system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's that? A 61 out of 61 out of 124. Four. So, yeah, two more to go and you're, and you're 50%. Oh, right. Right. I need to continue to work hard <laughs> and, and zoom in rather than just guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I must, must have... Oh, that like is? Some you system. stopped just randomly guessing. I've stopped and I've begun to study it <laughs> in, and also add that to my guess. Oh, I, I don't know. don't know. I'll have to go back and listen to see what my rationale is. So 
So this episode is sponsored by Zencaster. We love who Zencaster. Is the, the, who is? Who are the tool? Zencaster that which makes is the tool. which is the tool? Yes, they make Zencaster, which is. A yeah. really good recording tool that we use, and we've used it from day one we to have. record our podcast. Yeah, because we do yeah. not live in the same house, and so no. it's handy to be able to uh, connect over the internet. We can see yeah. each other, we can talk to each other, and it records it all for us. It's seamless. It's easy. We've never had any problem with it. And in fact, when we've invited guests on, the brilliant thing about Zencaster is you can extend it to. Oh yeah, well, here's here's the link. Just come on in, yeah. away you go, and then it will record separate audio tracks. That's what I like. As an editor, it records separate audio tracks, and then you can download them separately and put them in so that if I cough or Mark swears or something like that, then I can just <laughs> cut that out. It's fine. I leave the swears in. It's fine. They also have, for pro customers, post-processing that makes the sound sound even better, and it can do things like cutting out filler words, ums and ahs and stuff, which I do a lot of and, and end up cutting out in the edit so that you right. don't have to sit through that but it makes you sound the best you can sound if you're thinking about podcasting if you're already a podcaster and you're wanting to to have something that's seamless and useful and very easy to use we would thoroughly recommend Zencaster. and in fact if you go to zencastercom slash pricing and use our code fallacious trump or one word you will get 30 percent off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan because fundamentally we want you to have the same easy experience we do for all our podcasting and podcast content needs. And if you're up for podcasting, it's time to share your story and you should use Zencaster to do that. And it's time for the part of the show that this week, at least, is called Speaker of the House is Not a Logical Fallacy, because there isn't one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been yeah. a while. It's been almost two weeks now. We're, yeah, yeah. We're recording this uh, early morning on the 16th, and it was the third, I think, yeah. that McCarthy yeah. was ousted, which, I mean, yeah. he lasted 27 Scaramucci's. Right. <laughs> right. Which was more yeah. more than I expected. To That's be honest, the new smooth, smooth <laughs> measurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, two hundred and seventy days he lasted because when he got in after his fourteen failed attempts and then final fifteenth vote, he only got in because the I'm doing inverted commas Freedom Caucus, the the right. MAGA nut jobs. Yeah, yeah. That's not in inverted commas. No, no. MAGA nut jobs. <laughs> they yeah. they yeah. had a system where. He gave them his balls and they put them in a little jar mm-hmm. and then they said, okay, we'll vote for you. And that yep. meant that anyone, any single person in Congress could submit a resolution to vote for him to be ousted at any point. Yep. Yep. So I'm pretty surprised he lasted 270 days. Yeah, given, given that the right wing, the Republicans were still around. Yeah, but I mean, it, point, it, yeah. it led yeah. him to do things like start the impeachment inquiries against Biden when he probably wouldn't have done otherwise because they yeah. had nothing. For, for the um, lack of evidence, and, yeah. And approving various kind of, you know, the weaponization of government committee and all of that shit. Yeah. And these things came out of him being too afraid not to do the things the mad people wanted him to do. Because he knew yeah. that as soon as he didn't, yeah. didn't do the thing the mad people wanted him to do, he'd be out. And exactly so that's what happened. the glass on his ball jar yeah. and, and because needles into ultimately yeah. he went, he kind of agreed some things with some Democrats when the uh, budget was coming up for, for renewal yeah. and, and the, the government was going to shut down if, if they didn't sort it out. And he didn't want that to happen, and so he and was, he came to an and agreement. He was kind of mindful of the of the working people that would that he yeah. wants to continue to vote Republican, yeah. on the basis that they're supporting the working man in the way that the Tory Party in England is isn't doing either. Um, but they wanted to keep up that subterfuge. So if they shut down the government, many thousands of people wouldn't yeah. get paid. Yeah. 
So he was kind of going. Well, it well, wouldn't have been the know, first time that, that yeah. the Republicans had shut down the yeah. government just in recent years. Yeah, yeah. So they know yeah. what what happens, and it, it isn't. It doesn't work out well for them. They everyone no. knows that it's their fault, and they become yep. even less popular. But that wasn't enough for, for Matt Gates particularly, because coming to any kind of agreement with Democrats, working with Democrats for anything, is very very bad. Yeah. So Matt Gates proposed a, a vote and worked with the Democrats in Congress to get rid of McCarthy because it was basically ultimately the Democrats who voted him out plus several Republicans because the vote the makeup of Congress is so close. It's two twenty one mm. to two twelve. So wow. yeah. Um, yeah. had all of the Republicans wanted to keep McCarthy they could have done, but yeah. they didn't, not all of them. That meant he's out. And I wonder whether part of that is, yeah, if we get rid of him, that will cause utter, complete fucking chaos. Well, the Democrats, yeah, the, the, they could have decided to vote to keep McCarthy. But frankly, yeah. he's been shit. He hasn't done anything. Yeah. Because he's been <laughs> yeah. on a hair trigger of, of getting out all yeah. the time and so terrified to yeah. do anything that the mad people didn't want, uh, he yeah. hasn't done anything good at all. Everything yeah. has been shit. He hasn't worked bipartisanly. He just about caved just before they ran out of money and time. So mm. that's not good enough. They, I, I, in my opinion, correctly thought we can do better. And yeah. we don't know because we're even though we're 12 days on, 13 days on from that, we don't know who the leader is going to be. Initially, at first, it looked like maybe it might be Steve Scalise um, because mm. the Re- Republicans yeah, kind of shut yeah. themselves away in a room and... and voted a couple of times on yep. who should be speaker some people were saying maybe trump because the speaker doesn't have to be a member of the house of representatives and everyone else yep. went, i mean ridiculous that's stupid because surely somebody somebody <laughs> as speaker ought to be able to speak yeah rather than just rant yeah and have his own <laughs> agenda yeah so uh, jim jordan put himself forward he was endorsed by trump and lots of people don't like jim jordan and steve scalise yep. put himself forward and lots of people don't like Steve Scalise either. He's he's described himself as David Duke without the baggage. I mean, David Duke is all baggage, so I don't know what that means. Yeah. There is, I don't know what that would be. Oh, but you'd still <laughs> identify the nasty stain that had no baggage as David yeah. Duke. Yeah. Um, yeah. And initially, Scalise came out on top in terms of getting more votes than Jim Jordan. So he yeah. was the presumptive republican nominee for speaker obviously they then have to have a full house right. vote and the democrats are all voting for hakeem jeffries just like they did before because he's the democrats choice yeah so it's 212 for hakeem jeffries they need basically 217 votes with a full house it would be 218 but two seats are, are vacant at the moment so whoever gets the vote needs 217 assuming everyone wow. shows up if people right. stay away from the vote or vote present then the the winning margin goes down. The Republicans probably right. don't want it to go down to a level where 212 is a winning margin because then Hakeem Jeffries gets voted into Speaker. <laughs> yeah. So they yep. need yep. a lot of votes. They need pretty much every Republican to vote in the same way. And the Republicans, as Trump said, they, they're young. I don't think he meant they, yeah. they, they're young. I think he meant they eat each other. Yeah. But right. their yeah. own, or maybe. The, the, but, yeah, yeah. But, Basically, yeah. they are fighting, and they continue to yep. fight. And so yep. Scalise eventually realised that he was never going to get 217 votes. There were too many people who just were kind of saying they would never support him. So yep. he stepped down, which means that currently Jordan is the front runner, but right. that he hasn't got enough votes either. There's at least 10 Republicans who have said they won't vote for him. Obviously, the Democrats aren't going to vote for him because apart from the fact that he's kind of looked the other way when people were getting sexually abused while he was at yeah. Ohio State. Also, he's been in Congress for like 20 years and he has not passed a single bill. What? He hasn't done a thing. Wow, wow. <laughs> he's he's utterly ineffective as a congressperson. The main yep. thing he's done is being on the weaponization committee thing and that's been a pointless waste of time. right. So yeah. Vanderbilt University yeah. Center for Effective Lawmaking ranked yeah. all of the House Republicans. He is 217th out of 222 Fantastic. House Republicans in the 117th Congress. So that's who they wow. think is the best guy to be in charge of them all. No. That's back to our QAnon. These were the best proofs. Uh-huh. Wow. 
Oh my god! It's a tough, tough job because it's, it's too hard for Kevin McCarthy, certainly. Yeah, there's it. Yeah, there's this fabulous opening paragraph in the Guardian report of this that says how to unite the fractious majority and prove to a sceptical public that they are a party capable of governing, not just funneling right-wing outrage and culture war rhetoric. (laughs) For a minute, I thought I was reading about (laughs) the Tory party conference. Yeah. But it's, but it is, I mean, it's a, it's the, the leader of the right wing, both in the UK and the US, or the represent, you know, the one that kind of represents the party, uh, I hesitate to use the word unity, but it's a tough job because there are these infighting factions that are just about we've got to remain in power, so let's unleash the dogs of culture wars versus we need to be selling the idea that we're doing some governing, we're, 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 doing, some, we're doing a bit of parliamentarianism, we're not just shouting at people at their taxpayers' expense, so it's a it's a tough old job, and and also it's the job that uh, is probably the, the, one of the most Machiavellian of all because they it's the most powerful position in the house after the president. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, essentially it is the person who decides if bills go forward for a vote, if committees get formed, uh, all kinds of things are, are decided by mm. the Speaker. And it requires someone who has widespread support from their party to the extent yeah. that they are then able to corral their members to a vote, especially yeah. when the margin is so thin. They've, you know, mm. They can't afford to lose five votes to the other side on anything. Wow. Because they can't get anything passed. Wow! If if you know when it's yeah. two twenty one to two twelve, if five Republicans decide to vote with Democrats, essentially, the the yeah. Democrats win. <laughs> so yeah, whoever is in that spot needs to be someone who can bring his party together or her party together. Mm. And uh, I I say her as an afterthought because there's barely any yeah, females in the, uh, in the in yeah. the in the Republican Party <laughs> yeah. who yeah. are who well certainly none who have put themselves forward for. The, the job. Fortunately, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene have not even, their names haven't come up. Yeah. Um, yeah. But. Bo, oh, uh, no. God, that'd be awful. Yeah. So yeah. whoever ends up doing it has got an incredibly difficult job. Obviously, Jim Jordan isn't up for that. He doesn't have the support of most of his members after he won the vote. Because after Scalise pulled out, um, Georgia representative Austin Scott stepped up and put himself forward. Um, so there was a, there was a vote between Jordan and Scott, and Jordan won 124 to 81. This was on Friday. Wow. So Jordan kind of went forward as the as the party's choice, but then he called a second vote to ask if members would actually support him in a floor vote, yeah. basically because it's going right. to be him versus Hakeem Jeffries, probably. Yeah. And that vote was a secret ballot, and it went 152 to 55. So he got 152 votes from Republican members saying that they would vote for him to be Speaker. And he needs 217. So he's way short. The chances that over this weekend, or even over the next week, he can convince uh, yeah. another, what's that, 65 members yeah. to change yeah. their vote to support him. Well, because they took McCarthy 15 times yeah. to do it. And you kind of think, if the, if the 200-odd Republicans that collectively just go, no, we don't want you, we don't want you, is that it's the annoying guy in your class at school who just never wants to do anything yeah yeah think of the republican as that annoying guy who will never do anything but somehow commands this influence such that if they're not going to do it nobody else wants to do it yeah so go no i'm not going to do that because he's rubbish a bit like you know if they're that cool if they're the fonds and the other fond says no don't join the swim team because the swim team is awful nobody will join the swim team, even though lots of people would like to join the swim team. <laughs> yeah. So the so the Republicans, need, they want to have the Speaker so that the Democrats don't, but they can't, they're too busy going, oh, they're crap, they're crap, in order to, to get behind. They haven't fundamentally worked out the notion of right-wing politics, especially in the UK, and it's we can tell we're coming to the end of a... Uh, a parliament because the the notion that 
whatever we do collectively, we've got to stick together in order to remain in power. So they hide the the factions and the fractiousness, and they present a united front. They haven't even worked that out in the Republican Party. We just, yeah. we just need to, rather than just go, yeah, you're no fucking good. We're not going to vote for you. And yeah, so well, why don't you stand? Well, because I don't want to. <laughs> but I don't want you. you. How is that presenting a united front in the in the? And all the Democrats have got to do is just sit back with their arms. Yeah, absolutely. You know, We'll just wait for them to, you know, finish fighting, and then we'll just go. Yeah, all right. Well, this is the thing. It's been fifty-seven years since we've had a speaker. (laughs) Perhaps we ought to have one now. Yeah. When I when this happened two almost two weeks ago, some friends of mine who who don't follow American politics quite as fervently as I do (laughs) were like, "Okay, well, what what's the result of this going to be? You know, mid to long term, what how is it going to come out?" And obviously, I don't know. But I am. I said actually, I think this is potentially good for Democrats. I think that yeah. it could result because I don't think that any there's not enough Republicans who are as aggressively MAGA as right. the, the ones who got rid of McCarthy. So I don't think they will get someone more right wing to be in charge because I don't think yeah. there's an, and they'll get enough support. I think that they probably will end up having to have someone who is prepared to reach across the aisle because i th- i don't think mm. that anyone is probably going to get enough universal republican support i think they're going to yeah. have to get either some Repu- some democrat votes because if there was a republican who stood up and said look we've been doing everything wrong i want to change things i want to work with the democrats we need to make changes we need to make we need to actually start passing bills and making things better for American people. Doing some governing, yeah, yeah. They might only get like 12 Republican votes, but if all the Democrats vote for them, they're in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And if this gets to the point where Republicans are too pissed off with the system and stay home or vote present, it actually could become Hacking Jeffrey's job and it could be a Democrat speaker. I don't think they'll let it get that far. But I do think there's a chance that they'll need to choose a more moderate speaker in order to get mm. a little bit of Democrat support that will push it over the, the line. Because I don't the think they've got yeah, anyone so who can bring the party together. They're too fractured. It hands the control and the overall flavour of what the speaker is like to the Democrats because the, they are sitting on 212 yeah. votes. I do. So I, I think that's a genuinely possible outcome. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen. Mm. I hope it does. But in the absence of them coming up with a an as yet unnamed candidate who who it turns out everyone's in favour of, yeah, I think it's a possible outcome. And it might need yeah. to wait another couple of weeks while they scrabble around and fail to get anyone in. But yeah, we'll see. Well, it never ceases to be exciting, does it? That you know, just yeah. when you think we can't have had if we it can't possibly get any worse slash more exciting (laughs) it does and finally some things we really don't have time to talk about trump's civil fraud trial in new york started last week and trump even attended the first few days making sure to come out of the courtroom and yell to the press about how unfairly he was being treated judge arthur ingeran appeared at first to accept this as exactly the kind of behavior you'd expect from this defendant but by day two trump crossed the line when he posted a photo of the judge's court clerk along with her name and Instagram account, and suggested she was biasing the judge against him because she'd once had her photo taken with Chuck Schumer. The judge issued a partial gag order forbidding all parties from posting, emailing or speaking publicly about any of my staff, saying, personal attacks on members of my court staff are unacceptable, inappropriate and I will not tolerate them in any circumstances. Failure to abide by this order will result in serious sanctions. Trump deleted the post and sat huffily in the courtroom for another day before leaving during a break on day three to head to some campaign rallies where he continued to yell about how unfairly he was being treated. Meanwhile, his lawyers argued that massively overvaluing properties isn't fraud if you reckon someone might one day pay that amount for it. And former Trump employees testified that they were under pressure to inflate values because Trump liked to see his net worth going up and that they considered applying a premium to the value of various properties based purely on the fact that they were owned by the president. Meanwhile, Scott Hall, one of Trump's co-defendants in Georgia, has pleaded guilty to five counts of conspiracy, raising the question of whether he will now cooperate with prosecutors as a condition of his sentencing. Really looking forward to that televised trial. (laughs) 
So, if you're at a loss as to what to say to the orange pre-criminal at his club, and who wouldn't be, take a leaf out of an Australian billionaire's book. No, not Murdoch. Anthony Pratt of Pratt Industries, one of the world's largest packaging companies. According to special counsel Jack Smith's team's investigations, they discovered allegations that in a lull at Mar-a-Lago one evening where Pratt's a member, he brought up the subject of the American submarine fleet. As you do, according to Pratt's account, Pratt told Trump he believed Australia should start buying its submarines from the United States, to which an excited Trump, leaning towards Pratt as if to be discreet, yeah, then told Pratt two pieces of information about US submarines, the supposed exact number of nuclear warheads they routinely carry and exactly how close they supposedly can get to a Russian submarine without being detected. This all took place, of course, several months after Trump left the White House and uh, was no longer president. Anthony Pratt, the very model of discretion, must have noted this because he then went on to keep very quiet about it to 45 others, including six journalists, 11 of his company's employees, 10 Australian officials and three former Australian prime ministers. Some of the Australian officials that sources said he told were, as reflected in news reports at the time, involved in the then negotiations with the Biden administration over a deal for Australia to purchase a number of nuclear powered attack submarines from the United States. Ironic that in one braggadocious my Putin's bigger than yours moment, Trump talking at Fox Business about Ukraine said that if he was still president, he would make sure Russia understood that the United States is a greater nuclear power with the greatest submarines in the world, the most powerful machines ever built, and nobody knows where they are except half of Australia. Pratt sees no problem in shafting Trump and cozying up to Biden, describing himself as someone who tends to just side with the king. Mind if we just call you Machiavelli to avoid confusion, Bruce? Yeah, the fact he leaned in, like conspiratorial, because you wouldn't want other people to yeah. hear yeah. With the nuclear secrets you're divulging no. to a, a businessman, would you? That that would be wrong. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but he's just been played. I think it was Andy McCabe on the Jack podcast said it would be malpractice of foreign governments not to try and get this kind of information out of Trump. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's clearly yeah. so easy that if they're not, if you, mm. you haven't got hostile foreign governments trying to trick him into just boasting about secrets, you're yeah. not... Playing the game. You're not doing it right, are you? Yes, exactly. And it, and it is. And his and uh, Pratt's whole idea of I'm just going to side with the king is, is you, well, you would. You'd work out yeah, what absolutely. the, the you know, the, just business. The, oh, the overblown, self aggrandizing, um, self important king. Well, you just you flatter him and you all of that stuff. And to, to release the torrent of information cause yeah. you, that you know from this stupid, overweight, overheight, over orange idiot. It's it's the stuff of kings in fairy tales. In a shocking turn of events which nobody could have predicted, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has abandoned his beloved Democratic Party and decided to run as an independent presidential candidate I'm for 2024. Shocks! I could never have predicted that. While running yeah. ostensibly against Joe Biden for the Democratic nomination, Kennedy was lauded, amplified and lied about by various right-wing sources, which now seems to be coming back to bite them in the arse. His polling numbers among Democrat voters never really got above 20%, with more than that expressing disapproval. That 20% was presumably the ones who haven't been paying attention for the past 60 years and vaguely remembered a good guy called Kennedy who had something to do with politics. The more coverage RFK got, the more people noticed that he's a whack-job conspiracy theorist, and his approval ratings among Democrats dropped. But Republicans love that shit, and his GOP voter approval ratings frequently hit 50% and above. So now that he's running as an independent candidate, it looks like he's more likely to pull votes away from Trump than from Biden, which is probably why all his former buddies have turned on him, with the RNC calling him just another radical far-left Democrat, Ronald McDaniel calling him a Democrat in independence clothing and a typical elitist liberal, and Trump's spokesman Stephen Chung going for gold in the Irony Olympics by saying, voters should not be deceived by anyone who pretends to have conservative values. An RFK candidacy is nothing more than a vanity project for a liberal Kennedy to cash in on his family's name. 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> Possibly most damning, though, was the statement put out by four of his siblings, who called his announcement deeply saddening and dangerous for the country. Come on, other Kennedy siblings, join in. There's enough of you left to beat Paul Gosar's admittedly high bar of six siblings denouncing his political career. <laughs> <laughs> in a familiar whiff of Trump deflation techniques where the old windbag lets some of the overpressured hot air out of his assets hold to blow people off the scent of the size of his shizzle, the jurors in Rudy Giuliani's defamation case against the two Georgia electoral workers have been instructed that... It must, when determining an appropriate sum of compensatory presumed and punitive damages, infer that defendant Giuliani was intentionally trying to hide relevant discovery about the Giuliani business's finances for the purpose of shielding his assets from discovery and artificially deflating his net worth. Since Rudy's continued and flagrant disregard of this court's August 30th order that he produced financial related documents concerning his personal and his business's past and present assets. Consequently, Giuliani and his lawyer will be prohibited from making any argument or introducing any evidence stating or suggesting that he's insolvent, bankrupt, judgment proof, or otherwise unable to defend himself, since he failed to hand over evidence that will show that's true. In August, Rudy was judged to have defamed the workers and was ordered to pay damages. One of them, Ruby Freeman, has reported that Rudy's failed to take any of the actions ordered by the court, including turning over $89,000 in legal fees. Consistent with his prior track record in this matter, Giuliani failed to file any response, the judge wrote. Perhaps part of his delaying tactics is because he can't find a lawyer willing to represent him. His former lawyers are suing him for about $1.4 million in unpaid legal fees. Oh, and he also owes the IRS almost 550000 in unpaid federal taxes. Yeah, I guess that's enough to make even the strongest sphincter controller let fly a concophonous trousers trump for surely. <laughs> what the fuck is going on with George Santos? He got into a shouting match with a man in the halls of Congress who was criticising Israel's military. I guess that's not so weird, given how very Jewish George has claimed to be on occasion. But for some reason, he was holding a two-month-old baby at the time, and nobody seems to be able to figure out why. Santos had just left Representative Tim Burchett's office with the baby, and when Hill reporter Emily Brooks asked him if the baby was his, he said, not yet, and walked off. Huh? Maybe he's distracted by the fact that he's just been charged with 10 additional crimes in a superseding indictment, bringing his total to 23. Come on, George, that's barely a quarter of Trump's number. How do you expect to get any respect among serious politicians until you commit a few more federal crimes? The new ones include conspiracy, wire fraud, aggravated identity theft and credit card fraud, including charging almost $16,000 on a donor's credit card without the donor's knowledge. Last week, his former campaign treasurer, Nancy Marks, pleaded guilty to many of these same charges, and her attorney has said she will testify against Santos if subpoenaed. A small group of first-term New York Republicans in Congress have said they will introduce a resolution to expel Santos from the House, but given that would need a two-thirds majority, I don't see them getting enough Republican votes, because being a thieving, lying grifter isn't a bug in the GOP House, it's a feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you're looking for the example of why AI-created music and auto-tuned manipulations will ultimately take over the world, because we'll all be too busy tearing our own superior temporal gyruses out to prevent our brains from processing sound, rather than worrying about, say, climate change, hyper-processed food, or the extinction of the bees, then look slash listen no further than Lara Trump's Eric's Ivanka Melania, all of them look alike Mrs. new single a cover of Tom Petty's I Won't Back Down. In at number six with a bullet two weeks ago, according to Eric's tweet, it's now fallen out of the charts and Tom Petty can stop spinning in his grave. Despite Petty's family telling the Trumps not to use the song on the campaign trail in 2020, MAGA outlets downloaded it en masse, I suspect, before listening to it judging by the one-star reviews outnumbering the five-star, and no amount of good old boy Lone Star bravado can make what is essentially very poor, shrieky, twangy, very limited-range, auto-tuned karaoke, even as popular as Trump and the mass square of the January Sixers hit. Lara herself thankfully admitted on Australian Sky News, I am not seeking this as a career. I am not a professional singer. 
I'm sure I'll get a lot of critique from all of the haters out there of my voice and my singing ability. Yep, dang right. Just think, Lara, that with such self-awareness at 41, you could be lucky in following so many of your musical heroes, Elvis, Lennon, Marvin Gaye, Whitney, Billie Holiday, Kirsty McCall, and be dead very soon. It turns out sweaty, mustachioed foghorn Mike Lindell had his lawyers working on a no-win, no-fee basis. That is, they had no chance of winning and no chance of getting paid. Consequently, after three months of working for free, they filed to withdraw as counsel in his defamation lawsuit against Dominion and Smartmatic. Lindell has said he will definitely not settle the case, but had no idea who will represent him going forward. I would say he should talk to Trump to get a recommendation, because if there's anyone who knows lawyers who are prepared to argue bullshit without any guarantee of payment, it's Trump. But all the lawyers Trump knows are either very busy on one or more of his four cases pending trial right now, or are facing charges themselves. Lindell claims his money problems have been exacerbated by American Express slashing his credit from $1 million down to $100,000 overnight, which he claims is due to his political views. Amex say they don't make customer decisions based on personal views or political affiliations and conspicuously do not add that perhaps the reason they're reluctant to give Mike a million dollar credit line is because he has no hope of ever paying it back. He's already auctioned off all his stuff. He's struggling to pay the workers who spend their days filling his pillows with lumps. And now he's planning on holding a telethon to raise money to pay his legal fees. I'm not going to lie, I kind of want to watch that. But I don't think it will get him out of his current situation. Such a shame. (laughs) It's been conference time in the UK where Rishi Sunak and his gang and the two or three other gangs that make up the disunited party of the Tories slash UKIP slash GB News presenters went to Manchester by train in order to announce, among other things, the scrapping of the high-speed rail link to Manchester. Never once to shy away from opening their mouths, inserting their feet and blaming others for kicking them in the face, the housing minister said not all renters smoke weed and are bad people in gangs, leaving unsaid perhaps, no, some of them are white. The deputy Tory chairman in response to HS2 being scrapped quipped, well, who wants to go to Bradford anyway? Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, said halving inflation is the same as a 5p tax cut, which means that he either has no idea how the economy works or is lying through his teeth, because lower inflation means prices are still rising, just at a slower rate. Suella Braverman evoked the ghoul of Enoch Powell, saying multiculturalism has failed before going on to warn that a hurricane of migrants is coming and that the Human Rights Act should be renamed the Criminal Rights Act. And, of course, the party of such free-thinking literally threw somebody out of the building, a Tory voter, for quietly muttering dissent at Braverman's practically stiff-arm salute of a speech. Meanwhile, over at the Labour Party conference, somebody protesting about, well, what I'm, I'm not sure, they were still explaining it as they were dragged from the podium across the hall, made Starmer's speech a bit more showbiz by flinging glitter all over him before he began quipping, if that's the right word, no, no, it isn't. If he thinks that'll stop me, then he doesn't know me. Starmer drew a roar of applause as he had to take off his jacket and roll up his sleeves to lose the superficial sparkle and appear more down to earth and getting on with the work. See, the metaphors flow so effortlessly, (laughs) I'm beginning to think the whole thing might have been staged. Well, Let's hope they continue not to be dazzled by the glitz of the recent win over the SNP in Scotland and still realise there's a lots of sensible hearts and minds winning over work to be done before next year's election. The main photo that went viral of the glitter around Keir Starmer was such yeah. a fucking great photo. It really it made was, him look it? much better. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the protester yeah. totally the failed. Thing. It was like, it's either yes, to make him look, look really this. showbiz. Oh, it was yeah. so good. Or to have him take the jacket <laughs> off and appear to uh, uh-huh. uh, uh, eschew all the showbiz glitter. Yeah. yeah. And I can't believe you did a whole thing on the Tory party conference and didn't talk about Penny Morden's bizarre stand up and fight speech. I uh, know. Uh, well, I just. Fucking got... hell, what was that? I uh, know. It was so good. Did you watch the Michael Spicer? Um, <laughs> yes. He yeah. did kind of revive his man in the room and all. And then there's this bit where he breaks the fourth wall and looks at the camera and goes. <laughs> you see why I don't want to do this anymore? Do it anymore? <laughs> yeah. He said, like, don't just say stand up and fight again. It was so just weird. bizarre. Bizarre. 
<laughs> so that's all the bad arguments for faulty reasoning we have time for this week. You'll find the show notes at fallaciousTrump.com. And if you hear Trump say something stupid and want to ask if it's a fallacy, our contact details are on the contact page. If you think we've used a fallacy ourselves, let us know. If you had a good time, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, or simply tell one other person in person about how much they'd like our podcast. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash ftrump, just like our straw man level patrons, Laura Tomsick, Renee Zed, Schmutz, Mark Reiki and Amber R. Buchanan, who told us when we met her at QED, we could just call her Amber, though another listener recognised her at QED this year because we keep using her full name all the time. And our true Scotsman-level patrons, Melissa Sytek, Stephen Bickle, Janet Ueta, Kaz Tui, Andrew Houck, and our top patron, Lauren. Thank you so much for your continued patronage. It's really very much appreciated. Thank you. You can connect with those awesome people as well as us and other listeners in the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Fallacious Trump. All music is by The Outbursts and was used with permission. So until next time on Fallacious Trump, we'll leave the last word to the Donald. That's right. Go home to mommy. Bye. Bye.